feel free to get in touch with me because tonight we are studying Revelation's Lake of Fire. This is a subject um, that has brought many Christians to actually lose their faith in God. Uh, people like, for example, I don't know if you uh, knew this, but um, Darwin had been brought in a Christian home. And he had been taught through the Roman Catholic system that hellfire burns forever and forever and forever. And even though you've lived for just a few short space of years in this life, um, in the judgment, God is going to burn you forever and forever through the ceaseless ages. And that's what they taught. In fact, um, when St. Peter's Basilica was erected, um, the papacy recognized they needed huge, massive sums of amount of money to build that uh, edifice. And you can see um, just how exquisitely and expensive it is even today if you're going to visit there. But um, they brought up this thing called indulgences. And um, you could pay your way for your loved ones because when they die, they taught that your, your soul was immortal and that you would burn forever. Um, so but before that, you'd go to a place of limbo called purgatory, which they um, invented. It's not taught in the Bible. And if you paid the priests enough money, then your loved ones would be released from purgatory and saved from going to hell where they would burn eternally and then they could go to heaven. So that teaching meant led many, many people to lose their faith in God because how could God claim to be a loving God and he burns people forever and forever and forever? And so this is a subject that is very misunderstood in many Christian faiths today, not only Roman Catholicism. And so I'm praying that the Lord is going to bless us as we go through and understand um, what is Revelation's lake of fire. But before we do that, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time. We have to study thy word. This is such an important topic. Many people have become atheists and agnostics as a result of not understanding what hell fire is taught of in thy word. And I pray that you'll bless us, bless us with your spirit and guide and lead us into truth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Right. So Revelation's lake of fire. So Revelation in most graphic language repeatedly refers to the lake of fire and hell and the punishment of the lost. Fifteen times at least, Jesus pointedly uh, mentions the lake of fire. So John, who writes the book of Revelation, of course, as we know by now, he knows that the fire is not a fable, but rather it's a very necessary part of God's plan to abolish and to destroy sin and to make the righteous safe for eternity. So when you think about fire today, man, it's terrifying. And anyone who's been in a fire Oh, lost loved ones in the fire knows how awful it is. Grave problems confront many today, however, when we study the subject of hell in Revelation and, of course, the rest of the Bible. Thinking people have been shocked to read that the unsaved or the lost will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And because such words fill the mind with serious questions about God's justice and mercy, people lose hope and they lose faith in God. So the questions that come up into many people's minds are, are all the wicked punished forever regardless of the degree or number of their sins? Uh, does a sinner who died 3,000 years ago receive 3,000 years more punishment than one who dies today and is lost to the same sin? In other words, for those who believe that you die um, immediately or, I mean, you are burnt immediately if you are lost when you die, in other words, they believe that the soul lives on immortality of the soul. Um, then does someone who has died 3,000 years, 4,000 years, 5,000 years, are they still burning for 5,000 years, much longer than someone who dies today? Clearly, these are questions that have brought so much um, terror into the minds of people. So when they think of hell, um, they think, well, how can God get rid of sinners in a fire forever when they are burning forever? So in light of all these many questions, um, we want to turn to the Bible tonight. We want to see what does God have to say about the subject because millions, as I said, uh, have turned their backs on Jesus and have become infidels um, and have discarded the word of God and have nothing to do with this God of the Bible because of the teachings of 
many religious affiliations that God burns people forever. Is God like that? And if there's a God like that, then people hate that kind of God. And I too would hate that kind of God would burn people forever and forever for a short amount of people, um, a short amount of period of time that live on this earth. And so, my dear friends, the character and reputation of the omnipotent God of heaven is at stake. So I want you to consider with me as we're going to examine from the Bible what God teaches us about the truth of hell. So the first question I would like to ask this evening then is, when will the wicked meet their doom? Now, God knows how to exactly deal with this thing called the sin problem. And so here it comes from 2 Peter 2 verse 9. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve, the word is reserve, the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. So clearly they are reserved. They are not burning. The lost are not burning in hell today. They are reserved to the day of punishment. And that is going to come later, of course. And we've studied that already, but tonight we're going to go study it deeply. We understood, of course, when we study Revelation 20, that will happen, of course, when Jesus comes, uh, the day of judgment is the wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. But then after the thousand years, there's the actual um, execution of the judgment after the thousand years. Well, when is the judgment day? How many of you think that's a good question? I think that's a very good question. And, and we're going to discover here from the Bible, it tells us clearly, Matthew 13 verse 40, it says, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. So very clearly the tares which represent the wicked or the lost, they will be gathered together and burned in a fire. When will this be? Clearly the text says in Matthew 13 verse 40, at the end of this world. So the fires very easily right now are not burning. And so when the wicked are gathered by the angels of God, then they will be destroyed. So here it goes here in verses 42 now. And will cast them into the furnace of fire. They will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And so this will only happen, of course, when Jesus comes. Notice what Jesus says in John chapter 12, verses 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. What is it? The word that I have spoken will judge him. When is it? In the last day. So clearly, judgment comes in the last day, at the end of the world. And so, since the wicked are not punished until the judgment day at the end of the world, how many souls are in hell now? The answer would be clearly just from those texts, none. But we're going to read a whole lot more texts that clearly shows this point of view. So the question then I would ask is, if the wicked do not go to hell and death, where do they go? Many people struggle this. Many people struggle this. And here's the plain answer from the word of God. Job 21 verses 30. Now Job lost all his children um, and it was terrible for him. But he understood what happens to people when they die. Job 21 verse 30. For the wicked are reserved. Again, there's that word reserved for the day of doom. They shall be brought out on, on the day of wrath. When is the day of wrath, Job? Yet he shall be brought to the grave and a virgil kept over the tomb. So those who have died and not accepted God's grace, God's mercy, and have died lost, they are kept in the tomb, in the grave, wherever they are. Notice here in John 5, verse 28 and 29, do not marvel, Jesus says at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. And so it's still future. Jesus says the hour is coming. He goes on to say who have done, some who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So Jesus plainly taught this, that all who have died are in their graves until they are called forth by him. On the resurrection day. Now we've studied clearly in Revelation 20. There's the resurrection of the saved. Those who have died in Christ. When Jesus comes to this earth. We've studied it very clearly. And they come forth unto life eternal. The resurrection of life. And then of course after the thousand years. There's the resurrection of condemnation. 
or the wicked or the lost. And of course, they are resurrected to receive the execution of the sentence, which is eternal, not eternal fire, but it, the, the consequences of the fire will be eternal, but the fire itself will go. We're going to study that. All right. Now, what rewards do the righteous and wicked receive? Very clearly, Jesus tells us, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 6 verse 23. So until we come to know Jesus Christ, we are all lost and without hope. And here's the precious promise in the same text. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that beautiful? So we don't have to die the second death, eternal death. And we want to know then what does this death which the wicked receive in the fire? Which death will the wicked receive in the fire? Which are still, which is still future? And here we have it from Revelation 21, verse 8. It says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, the murderers, sexual, immoral people, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So the second death is when all sinners are destroyed after the thousand years. We've studied this very clearly in Revelation chapter 20. And so um, in Revelation 21, this is just before, of course, the holy city, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. It lands on this planet, planet Earth. And then, of course, the execution of the sentence, which is eternal death, will come through the lake of fire. Many souls never, many say, sorry, souls never die. But what does God say about a soul? Now we've studied this as well when we looked at what happens when a person dies. But here's Ezekiel 18 verses 4. Behold, all souls are mine. Now here's the answer. The soul of the father as well of the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. So clearly a soul is not immortal. A soul does not carry on living forever because death is the absence of life by definition. And so if a soul can die, it is not immortal. And a soul is you and me, the breath of God plus the body while we are alive is a soul. So here is Job again, Ezekiel, sorry, Ezekiel 18 verse 20. The soul who sins shall die. And so very, very clearly, when the fires of hell are to be rained down from heaven and also will come up from the deep of the earth, the fire destroys sin. And those who have held on to sin will be destroyed by the fires. And so we've studied in a previous lesson um, at the close of the thousand years of Revelation 20 that when the holy city of God comes down out of heaven, it settles on the earth where the Mount of Olives now stands in Jerusalem. What does this fire do to the wicked? I think that's an important question because many people don't understand what this is all about. And straight from the word of God, Revelation 20 verse 5 says, but the rest of the dead, in other words, those who are lost, this is after the thousand years, did not live again until the thousand years were finished. And so what happens now? They, the wicked, went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So the city, the new Jerusalem has come down from heaven after the thousand years. Imagine a city coming down onto this earth. It rests in the Mount of Olives, which splits open into a wide plain. And so the devil deceives again the wicked who have been resurrected, and he convinces them that they are more than those in the city, and they surround the city with an intention to overthrow the city. Well, what happens? Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. I mean, just the word devoured means totally destroyed. So the wicked of all angels now are raised to life, and Satan leads them in a dramatic assault upon the holy city in an attempt to capture it. As the attack begins, fire falls down from God out of heaven upon the wicked. And this is the hell of the Bible. This is hell fire. And it only happens after the thousand years. Uh, and here's another text here in Revelation 20. The devil who deceived them 
he too was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Well, what does this fire do to the earth? We're going to ask, we're going to answer this question, this question. And what does it do to the wicked? What does it do to the devil? Well, 2 Peter 3 verse 10 says, The heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. So when the Bible talks about three heavens. The first heaven is this atmosphere in which uh, we breathe. You know, and then the second heavens is, of course, the space, um, just as we move out. And then, of course, the third heavens is where the throne of God and heaven itself is. Paul speaks about when he says, I was taken into vision into the third heaven. And so the heavens here that it's talking about, of course, is this atmospheric pressure uh, that we are in here. All that's going to be here will burn up. It says the heavens will pass away. Um, all the satellite uh, stations will burn up in the heavens there because they are all man-made things. And so it goes on to say here, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. That word burned up in the Greek actually means totally destroyed. And so the fire does go out. Well, the fire will be the exact size of the earth and will actually consume the heavens too around the earth. The elements of the earth will melt from the heat and everything on the face of the earth will be burned up. You ask me, well, how does Malachi describe this fire and what it does? And Malachi makes it very, very plain and very, very clear. So follow me with this text here. Malachi chapter 4, we're going to read later on up to verses 3. But for now, Malachi 4 verses 1. It says, for behold, the day is coming. Isn't that very clear? It's speaking of when this earth will be destroyed with fire. So it says, the day is coming. So hell is not burning right now. Hell is not some place in the middle of the earth where the devil is in charge of all the wicked. Uh, hell the fire that is going to destroy the wicked is coming. It's future. So it says, behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, that's the wicked now, yes, all who do wickedly will be, again, it's very making, making very clear that, that the tense is future, will be stubble, and the day which is coming shall burn. So very clearly, the day is coming, it will be, it shall burn, all future. And it will burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that it will leave them, the fire will leave them, neither root nor branch. So if you've ever watched a fire, I'm sure we've all done that, and you see it burning. By the way, that's a, a cornfield, and what is remained there is the stubble. You know, farmers burn the stubble to prepare the fields for the next harvest. And so as you see this fire sweeping through the stubble, and, and, and here clearly uh, it speaks of, the wicked like stubble, right? So when you see the, the fire burning through the stubble, it, it leaves nothing behind. When it's finished, it's finished. And it goes out when there's nothing left to burn. So the wicked will burn like stubble or dry grass. And the Bible says they burn up. And that little word means, that little word means in the Greek, it means that expression rather, uh, neither root nor branch. It's an expression for total destruction. In other words, the, no one will be able to escape this fire. The Bible also refers to it as unquenchable fire. It, it doesn't mean it will not stop burning. It just means no one will be able to put that fire out but God himself. It's unquenchable because it will do that which God has set it to do. And, and when it's out, it's out. Only God you will never be able to jump into a, a pool, for example, of water uh, if you are lost on that day and try and extinguish that fire. So it's unquenchable in that it cannot be extinguished until its work is done. Well, will the fire finally go out is the question. And here comes the answer here in Isaiah 47 verses 14. Behold, they, it's talking about the wicked again, using the same word as stubble, right? As in Malachi, behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. So Isaiah is also talking of in the future tense. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. You see what it's saying there? Very clearly, it's unquenchable fire because nobody will be able to put it out. So the wicked will not be able to deliver themselves from the power of the flame. It shall not be a coal to be warmed by, nor a fire to sit before. You know, I was in the bullock this weekend 
um, at Champagne Lodge, and it was a little bit cold because of the rain. And so we we lit a fire there, but it was a warm, cozy fire uh, with my family there. And we 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 gathered around this fire. But hellfire is not me type of that that type of fire. It is going to be a dreadful fire. It'll be a fire that is going to destroy the wicked. It's not going to be a fire to take lightly. And so the fire burns them as stubble, the Bible says. But when the stubble is burnt up, the fire goes out. And not even a coal will be left glowing. Isaiah 47 uses the symbols um, and language very similar to that of Revelation 16 and 19. And for a very good reason. Both refer to the punishment and destruction of spiritual Babylon. Now, next study, lesson 21, we're going to study on spiritual or mystical Babylon. And we're going to discover and see that this power is going to share the same fate as the devil and the lost. Now, Jude, there's only one chapter in verse 7. It tells us the type of fire that will be the hell fire is referred to as the fire that destroyed the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and its immortal inhabitants. Notice what it says here. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And so one might say, you see, Brian, it says the eternal fire. I want you to understand that the consequences of the fire is eternal, but the fire does not burn for eternal eternity. You see, because the Bible is telling us, just as Sodom and Gomorrah are an example of hellfire, and I've been to the very area in Jordan where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be. It's nothing but a barren wilderness. It's nothing but a great salt pan. And so Sodom and Gomorrah are not burning today. And the Bible says the fire of hell is going to be an example, right? It says they, uh, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them are in a similar manner to these as, as an example after the fires of hell. And it will be that the fire will go out. And so what is left when the fire goes out? Very clearly now here in Malachi 4 verse 1, it says, You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. So this is talking, this is God speaking to those who will be saved, the redeemed. When the fires have gone out, the wicked will be ashes under the soles of the feet of the righteous. Have any of you, ever gone onto a fire that's burnt out and it's just left ash. Now, I've done this several times, especially when I was a young boy. You know, you'd like to go to where the fire's burnt and you go and you trample on the stubble that used to make a nice crackling sound under my feet. And, and it's ash. There's no heat. Ash is incombustible. It's whatever could have been burnt is burned out and there's nothing left. And so the wicked will be like that. The fire goes out because they'll be like ash. And so David says that the wicked will not be found. And why? Why will the wicked not be found? Psalm 37 verses 10. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. So, so if, if like people believe and some churches teach that the wicked burn for eternity, clearly you'd be able to find them. You know, they'll be screaming somewhere. I mean, what kind of a heaven would it be if you and I go there and say some of your kids don't make it? Maybe your husband doesn't make it or your wife doesn't make it. And you living in eternity and you know that your loved one is burning for eternity. What kind of heaven would that be? It makes no sense. The Bible says you will look for the wicked and their place shall be no more. It goes on to say there in verse 20, but the wicked shall perish. What does that word perish mean? Gone, finished. And the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish. Notice the word vanish into smoke. They shall vanish away. In other words, totally destructed. 
totally destroyed, sorry, and left with no root or branch. And so uh, very quickly, I just want to go through a summary here. The wicked will die. The wicked will perish. The wicked will be burned up. The wicked will be utterly consumed. The wicked will be turned into ashes. The wicked will be as though they had not been, and Satan himself even will be totally destroyed. How long will the wicked suffer in the fire? I'm going to answer this question thoroughly. Notice what it says here in Revelation 22, verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And so the reward of eternal life will be given to those who have been faithful to Jesus when he comes the second time. And the reward of eternal death will be given, of course, to the wicked. But the execution will be after the thousand years. We've studied that before. So Jesus says he will reward or punish all according to their works or conduct. Some will suffer longer than others, but soon all will be turned into ashes and the fire goes out. And so Jesus respects the choice of the wicked because they have refused his offer of grace and mercy. And so we are all created as free moral agents. Sin has brought death. God has given his son, Jesus Christ, as the elixir or the solution to eternal death. And so it is a choice we make for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and whoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now we just read there in, in Psalm 37 verse 20 that the wicked will perish. So, so God doesn't want us to perish eternally. He doesn't want us to die eternally. He wants us to be saved in his, in his kingdom. But if we don't want to be saved in his kingdom and we want to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season and die with the evil angels and with the devil, then God respects our choice because in love, he now protects the righteous from having people who don't want to be in heaven. And, and in any case, if God would take the wicked to heaven, Heaven would be a most miserable place for them. They would not enjoy the fellowship and worship um, of the saints and of God. They, they would want to continue in their wickedness and heaven will be a place where there is no sin and no wickedness. And so God respects their choice and he allows them to be destroyed with the devil because we can discover that the fire of hell was never intended for human beings. What happens to the devil in the fire? I'm sure many want to know the answer to this question. And so the Bible tells us very clearly in the book of Ezekiel what will happen to the devil. And this is a text speaking about the devil. God did not make a devil. He made a beautiful, perfect being called Lucifer. And because of his pride and because of his selfishness, he made a devil of himself. And he rebelled in heaven. And with a third of the angels... He's been warring against God ever since they were thrown out of heaven. And so notice what it says here. By the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. So the devil has been trading with sin. He's been tempting people ever since he's caused Adam and Eve to fall. And so that's the merchandise he offers. You read about the, the three temptations there in the Gospels where the devil came to Jesus and tempted him to turn the stones into bread, appetite. He tempts people on appetite, many fall for that. Um, he tempts people, the next temptation was, well, why don't you just throw yourself down, the angel will save you. Presumption that you can do what you want, God's going to save you anyhow. And then the third one is he offers people fame and fortune. He offered Jesus, he said, if you will fall down and worship me, I will give you the kingdoms of this world. And so many fall for money, many fall for the talents and the goods that Satan offers them in this life, but it's only for a season. So notice what it says here. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst, speaking about what's going to happen to the devil. It, the fire, devoured you, and I turned you, what's that word? To ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. That's, of course, the saved. Those who will see the fire destroy the devil. I can't wait for the time when the devil and his evil angels will be destroyed because he has brought so much war and pain and sickness and sorrow and misery and suffering on this earth. 
And so he will be turned into ashes. Satan will be destroyed. Even he will not burn forever, even though he's caused so much misery. Satan will be no more forever. Notice what it goes on to say. Therefore, I brought a fire from your midst. What does this fire do? It devoured you and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. You have become a horror and shall be no more for how long? Forever. So when the fire even destroys the devil who will obviously burn longer than anybody else, because the Bible says to him who much is given, much is required. And so because the devil has been given so much favor and honor and privilege and he rebelled against God with no reason, he will be destroyed much longer than anyone else. That's God's prerogative. Will people enter the fire bodily or as spirits? I think this is an important question to deal with. And Matthew 5 verse 30, this is what it says here. This is the words of Jesus, by the way. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members, like your hand, perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. So clearly the whole body will be cast into the fires of hell. And so here, of course, Jesus is using an analogy. It's a metaphor. He's saying, listen, if, if your eyes are a problem um, and cause you to sin because you can't stop looking at wickedness, it would be better for you to be blind. Not that God is saying, take your eyes out now, but it would be better for you to be blind than to have that temptation. And so rather than it's better to give your life to Jesus and he will save you from the fires of hell. And so people will enter hell alive and they will have bodies and they will be destroyed in the fire. How long that will take? God alone knows. So the picture of hell is a real fire with live human beings being destroyed by the fire. And so God does not want us to land up there. Does the soul burn forever with only the body being destroyed? Matthew 20. Matthew 10, verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, this is the complete human existence. Both soul and body, because your body plus the breath of God or the spirit of God is the soul. And so the body will be destroyed. The soul will be destroyed in the fires of hell. And so everything that that comprises a person, body and soul, his intelligence, his personality or her intelligence, her personality, life and everything else that makes a person an individual will be destroyed when it says both soul and body. It represents the total being. And of course, the devil, Satan, who misrepresents God, he has caused people to look to God as a tyrant, that God has allowed sin when he is the originator of sin, and that God is a merciless, cruel God, and he'll destroy people forever and forever in eternal fire. And so, friends, the tragedy is that God has been given the that Satan has brought about through a teaching of eternal torment and eternal hell. By the way, Johann Tetzel, who was a cardinal sent from Rome, when he came to Germany, he came with a chest. And on this chest, on this wagon, it had a slot in it. And he would go into the cities of Germany and tell the, the people of Germany that, listen, if you will come and put money in this chest, that was the money to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, then you can buy an indulgence. In other words, an indulgence is uh, you'll be forgiven of your sins, whatever they are. And sometimes you could buy an indulgence for even more money that you could pay for your sins that you'd commit in the future. Of course, Martin Luther told them this was a lot of rubbish. And Martin Luther believed in the soul sleep. He did not believe in in an immortal soul and he did not believe in an eternal fire um, that God would burn people forever the fires of hell and so 
that's where there was a big problem. And so the Reformation actually intensified because of these false teachings of Rome. What is Job's question regarding God's justice? Is God's justice vindicated by hellfires? Notice what it says, Job 4 verse 17. Can a mortal, what does mortal mean? One who is subject to death. Can a mortal be more righteous than God? That's the question. Can a man be more pure than his maker? The Bible is very clear that only God has immortality. But God is going to give the gift of immortality at the end of the world when Jesus comes. And of course, that gift will be given to the righteous. So nobody is immortal. Whom did God plan the fires of hell for? I think this is a very good question. How many of you think that's a good question? Clearly here, yeah, this is what the Bible says. Matthew 25 verse 41. Then he will say, God will say this to those on the left. That's the lost. Depart from me, you cursed, the lost, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Again, the word everlasting fire doesn't mean the fire lasts forever. It means the consequences of the fire. The results of the fire will be everlasting. In other words, the wicked are lost forever. But the fire, as we have already studied, goes out, it burns out and becomes ash. It says, the war broke in heaven, Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. So the devil has always been seeking to war against God. And God has prepared hellfire to destroy sin, Satan and his angels. The fires of hell are never intended for any human being unless they choose. All who have rejected God's grace will be destroyed in hell because they have chosen. God lovingly pleads with us every day that we will have our sins forgiven and that Jesus wants us to be saved, but he will never force us. God respects our choice. What is the dreadful result of this fire? What is the dreadful result of sinners called? What is it? The Bible tells us in Isaiah 20 verse 21, it says, he will be angry as in the valley of Gibeon. Now, when God gets angry, it's not like God is revengeful and God wants to now take pleasure in punishment. No, it just means God is angry that people have rejected his offer of mercy. And so, you know, when, when, when an innocent person is killed, you know, you get angry angry because you know an innocent person has been killed but but it's not like you want to take revenge um at least it shouldn't be uh notice what it says here this is how god views the punishment of the wicked that he may do his work that's the destruction of sinners his awesome work and bring to pass his act his unusual act the king james says a strange act this is the new king james translation and so even the fires of hell is an, a strange act from God. When God's new kingdom comes, what will happen? This is what we as Christians hope for. This the Bible calls the great hope. This is what Jesus promised in John 14 verse 1 to 3. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you will be also. And so when God's new kingdom comes, what will happen? And so here it says here, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So the, 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 the righteous who have lost some of their family perhaps in the fires of hell. It will be a terrible thing. But their eyes will be wiped. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things that have passed away. And the former things include hell and the fires of hell. God's plan is to completely rid the universe of evil. And eternal hell would, if, it, if there was an eternal hell, it would perpetuate sin and evil. And it will make us impossible to forget it because if the fires of hell burn forever, there is that conscious awareness that there are wicked people still burning. And if it was your family in there, how would you be able to serve God when he's destroying your family forever and forever and forever? And so very, very clearly, the fires of hell will go out. What should be my reason for serving Jesus? I think this is an important question. And this should be our reason. John 14 verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, 
If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. And so the only reason that we should serve Jesus is because we love him because he first loved us. The Bible says, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 verse 8. And so God loves us. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus, to die for us. John 14 verse 24. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. And so clearly here, the Bible tells us that we must serve God because of love. Will sin ever rise up again after it has been destroyed? How many of you think this is an important question? Will sin arise again? Now, now, if eternal fire continues, that means sin is continuing as well. So notice what Nahum the prophet says here. Nahum chapter 1 verses 9. What do you conspire against the Lord? He's talking about the wicked now. He will make an utter end of it. And here comes the answer. Affliction will not rise up a second time. In other words, rebellion, sin will not rise up a second time. Why? Because God is going to make a total end of sin. What will God do after sin and sinners are destroyed? And here it comes now. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former, in other words, the wicked, sinful, old past life, the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. And so if the wicked are burning eternally, of course, it will come to mind. But if God has destroyed sin and sinners forever, it will not come to mind. And so here in Revelation 21 verses 3, it says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And so that's the heaven that God wants us, us to be citizens of. This is wonderful news. This is fantastic news. God moves in with his people on planet earth a new earth where there's no more sin and sinners everything that adam and eve lost will be restored and more god's people will at long last have found joy unspeakable and there will be no sin there will be no sinners no devil to tempt us everything will be totally destroyed that is of sin and so i pray that you've been blessed by the study and I want to appeal to you. Jesus invites you as we come to the end of the study. Jesus invites you into his fabulous new kingdom. Have you accepted the invitation? Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 says this here. He says, come unto me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. What is troubling you today? Are you troubled by anything? Don't let your heart be troubled. Is sickness, a terminal illness troubling you? Is your finances troubling you? Is a wayward child troubling you? Give it to Jesus. He says, come unto me. And he says, I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. I pray for each one of you that is listening here. That you will find rest in Jesus. That you will accept the invitation of his love and mercy. That the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, is all that makes the difference between heaven and hell. And I pray that you will choose life and you will choose Jesus. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. Tonight we have heard the good news that you are a loving God. That even though sinners will be destroyed in the fires of hell, they will not burn forever and forever through the ceaseless ages. This is a lie of the devil. The fires will go out. The judgment day will come and it will only burn for a while. We thank you that you have the answer to the sin problem. And that is found in the life, death and resurrection of your son, Jesus. I pray that we will accept the grace and mercy that Jesus offers us today, tonight. That when Jesus comes... We will be saved at last with him. Amen and amen.